to the Epic Conversation. Uh, this is now our fourth one, I think. Um, and uh, no, sorry, third one, third one, damn, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Um, and we're going to be continue having more Epic Conversations as we go through lockdown period, but not only through that, as we go uh, carry on, I'll carry on doing uh, Epic Conversations with everybody on a Tuesday. Um, we'll have a couple of evening sessions. So, for example, uh, this coming week, we're going to have a couple of evening, evening sessions with some experts around um, finance, bank finance, and also the opportunities in the property market beyond uh, uh, lockdown. Um, but I uh, just want to welcome, firstly, um, our four experts that are yeah, four experts that are joining us, and also um, Epic members. And those of you that aren't Epic members, welcome. And if it's your first Epic conversation or first introduction to us, hopefully you have a great experience. Um, and then you feel free to get in touch with us um, as you go forward. Um, we have now uh, nicely 68 people in the uh, in the room, so it's getting up nice. We had 200, 217 people registered for the webinar, so uh, we are expecting quite a lot more people as they come through the door. Um, of course, sorry, Wolfram, it's going to... Uh, Cool. Okay. So, um, firstly, is to just introduce everybody. Um, we've got, uh, for our, like I said, our four experts joining us around property development. And really, the subject of the webinar is um, how to get started in property development. Um, you know, property investment is spoken about a lot, and and I think um, property investment and property development get um, muddled up a lot. Uh, and everyone needs to understand that there's a, quite a big difference between investing in property that already exists and really being the manufacturer or the creator of something that could firstly make you a lot of money, could be quite spectacular, is quite exciting but quite risky. And um, for that reason, I brought together a panel of four experts that are going to have a bit of a chat today um, around getting started in property development. So firstly, I'm going to introduce um, Francois, uh, Francois Hennis, who's a property developer himself. And Francois has brought together his team that he works with actively on the property development to have this discussion. So um, I'll hand it over to Francois shortly. Uh, we've got Razik Nordin, who's an architect, um, Scott Pinar from Clever Prop as a um, property development sales expert, and then Andre Fanzel, who is an attorney and expert in the space as well. So quickly, just hand over to you, Francois, for introductions. Thanks, Grant. Appreciate it. And uh, welcome, everybody. It's really great to be spending this time together. Um, so as I always say, you know, am, am I the developer with the most experience? Absolutely not. Have I done, you know, many, many hundred million rand projects? No, I haven't. Um, but I do have, you know, 10 years of experience. I work in partnership with, with very big guys in the industry. Um, and my role as part of our development team, whether I'm invested in the project or not, is I'm in charge of running the project. Uh, on behalf of the client, uh, you know, running the whole professional team, appointing the contractors, basically taking the project right from when we find the piece of land, deal evaluation, right through when you're handing the keys over and everybody gets paid. So I think what's what's really great about having, um, sorry, just to add to that, you know, you won't really find a lot of successful developers out there in the market and necessarily sharing, sharing you know, their skills and their knowledge with you because uh, essentially they would be creating competition and that's something that, Myself and a few peers often speak about, and it's mostly the, the you know the older guys in the market. Where I think, as as younger as a younger generation in your thirties and forties coming through, we've got to be much more open for collaboration. So you know, I work with the Vian Property Group and the Trilogy, um, the Trilogy Group, and uh, we do you know most of our developments in partnership. And I think um, you know the nice thing about a platform like this is if you look at somebody like Skalk and Razik and Andre, you know we started working together, but through the process we've actually you know become very good friends as well. So there's definitely a long-term relationship. So when you can trust somebody and you can bring the right team together, that's really really important. You now, so um, you know Skalk's Skalk's actually got a legal background, so you can imagine uh, a real estate agent that understands law as well. Um, that's why we, we prefer to work with Skulk and very key is that he understands developments. You know, when it comes to developments, you can't just use any estate agent. They really need to understand the legal side of things, the development process, um, as well as sales and what the market's doing. So I'm really happy to have Skulk on board here. Yeah? Um, and then uh, Razik from UF Architects, uh, him and his brother's firm. Razik's got a lot of experience in res not only residential development, but also, you know, retail and hotel space and, and, and public works as well. Um, so many years of experience from Razik's side and really have to have him here. Um, and then Andre, uh, you know, Andre does all our legal work and even 
I have to say, every single other developer that I've, I've introduced on Rate 2 have subsequently taken his services on. So I think that speaks volumes. And what's great about Andre as well is he's got his NDA, so he doesn't only understand law, but he understands business as well, which is really important when it, when it comes to deal structure. So really welcome, gents, and thank you for taking the time. And I know Grant will probably get into this, um, but obviously we've got about an hour together. Post this, there's a series, so understand that we won't necessarily be able to answer each and every question in detail. Fortunately, we have prepared some some questions for the guys as an overview that we're going to ask them and hopefully not put them on the spot too much. Um, but I mean, that, that's the introduction from my side, Grant. So, so back to you if you want to get going with some with some questions. Thanks, Francois, and thanks for a quick introduction. Um, I think maybe what we do is we quickly start just with introductions across the expert team. Um, so maybe just go one by one and just a quick hi, um, you know, what you're doing and then go from there. So, so let's um, start off with Scott from Cleverprop. Hi, guys. Um, thank you for the opportunity, Grant and um, Francois, for inviting us. Um, it's probably for our firm to be represented here and to speak to your listeners. Um, yeah, as, as Francois, thank you for the very kind and generous introduction there. Um, so I come from a legal background. I'm still a practicing attorney as well and also have an estate agency called cleverprop.com. So we're a fixed fee estate agency um, and I focus mainly on our development space. And then we've got other field agents that focus on the normal um, consumer to consumer base and hope to be adding some value and giving you some insight into what estate agents do um, when it comes to developments. Great, thank you. Um, and then uh, Razik. Hi, good afternoon everyone. Um, thanks for the platform um, and the opportunity to introduce you as architects. Um, my name is Razik Nordin. I'm one of two partners. Uh, our company is based out in Cape Town. We specialize in complex architectural challenges as we, as we like to call it and unlocking development property rights. Uh, we focus on the full range of building typologies, working both in the public and private sector. Um, our project ranges from the 500k ex general extension all the way through to our latest STP approval of 100, 850 mil project uh, mixed-use development. So varying complexities. Um, and I'm uh, thankful for the opportunity to, to uh, help you guys through this understanding the de development space. Oh, great. Thank you. And then, um, Andre, Andre. You, you there? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, and thank you for the opportunity, Grant and Francois. Uh, just briefly about myself. I am a practicing attorney. I've got my own law firm called BZ Law. And my two major specializing fields is, is property law and commercial law. I've got a few, quite a big, uh, quite a few big development clients and uh, mainly what I do for them is I help them structure the deals from the beginning right through to the end um, because obviously there's a lot of implications, uh, legal risk, tax and uh, just general uh, legal principles that need to be uh, in place right from the beginning in order for you to be able to execute well at the end. So that's basically why I'm sitting here today to just give a brief uh, explanation of my legal process flow in, in development. Brilliant. Awesome. That's great. Thank you. So thanks, guys. So, so again, um, if you guys have any questions as we go through uh, the discussion on each, uh, we've got a couple of questions for each expert, uh, just pop your questions into the Zoom group chat and I'll try and make sure I get them asked and answered. Um, obviously, Francois mentioned that this is an introduction to a 12-series uh, 12 or 12-episode 12 uh, series that, uh, that we're putting together to get started in property development. We will dig into the various stages of development uh, in more detail by each expert. Um, but quickly, just uh, if we start off with um, asking uh, Skulk. Skulk, just first question I've got for you is what is the agents um, uh, or the primary functions of an estate agent um, in a development process? Thanks for the question, Grant. Um, well, obviously, as you all know, the um, function is to generate interest and convert them into sales, um, and not only sales, but bankable sales. And for that, there's a whole process that we need to do and a number of check boxes um, that we need to fulfill um, prior to the actual marketing and taking the concept and turning that into reality. 
So I've summarized it into to the groundwork and then to the marketing and negotiation skills and then finally the deal closing and feedback. So from the initial groundwork, we work very closely with the developer and his team. Um, once they've identified land, they will come to an estate agent and request feedback on the viability of the product that they take to the market. So through our markets research and expertise in that field, um, we then go to them and say, instead of a one-bedroom apartment, maybe bachelors will work better here. Um, also then do tra um, trained searches in, in the area to see um, what are the, the viable sales prices for these, which obviously um, makes a big um, impact on the feasibility of the project as a whole. Um, once we've done the market research and evaluation and the feasibilities and all of that uh, make sense for the developer, um, we then proceed um, with the, com uh, the complete marketing material. So in a development, um, as I've noted earlier, um, we need to take the concept of the development and make that a reality and bringing it to, it, to life in, um, in the space, in the marketing space and sell this concept to someone. So what we do is we work closely with, um, with the um, web developments, um, people that do our brochures and sales. We do our investment packs and all of that. Um, so we're taking the development front con concept, give life, blow of, um, give life to that. Um, and then from there, the actual marketing process starts. Um, marketing process of development is much different than to a normal house. Um, usually you don't have, um, or not many developments have show houses or actual property that you can show and view. So um, online um, digital marketing is, is pretty much the way to go. Um, so we do, we've worked closely with um, Friends of Razik as well to, to do these videos and bring, as I said, the de development, the images and the drawings and bring that to life and, and, and give a, um, actual feel to that. Um, then once the marketing and advertising is out there, um, we need to start closing deals. As I said, development is very different to normal sales. We're selling a concept and lots of people think, oh, but that's easy. You've, you've just got your, you've got your renders, you've got your people coming on and from there um, just sign the OTP. Um, unfortunately, it's a, it's a very different buyer that buys into developments that buys, buys normal properties. Um, mostly, most, mostly of your, your purchases are investors. Um, so we're dealing with uh, a person with knowledge and skills. So the questions that they ask um, of the development process is much different to just transferring a normal property. They want to know where we are in the stages, how long are they going to take before they, um, with, before they can make money on their asset. Um, so negotiation skills and knowledge of the development process is key to, any, to this um, success and sale of, uh, of a, of a de development. Um, so luckily that helps me a bit with my legal background and working with the commercial, um, commercial areas as well as the um, development space and property um, history from my legal skills to go through that. And then lastly, and I think this is where a lot of estate agents um, fall short, is, is, is on deal closing and feedback. So as soon as the deal's closed, the OTP is signed, everything's in place, um, lots of agents then leave that client or that investor and just move on to the next because all he's chasing is commission. Whereas the easiest sale in future is getting the loyalty of an investor at your first project. If you've got him on that, you'll, you'll buy into your second and your third. So it makes the sales process much easier. So we, we, we install in our agents to continually follow up together with the attorneys and to keep them up to, up to date on, on the development process, where they are and when they can start realizing their asset. Awesome. So um, not the usual estate agent, but quite a specialized space for an estate agency to work in, like I say, understanding the development process, which is, which is vitally important. Um, it's clear that the, you, you as an estate agent start work, walking the journey quite early with the um, developer. So it's not like you're waiting until the, the space is built and, and finalized to try and just sell the property. Yes, that's, that's correct, Grant. Um, as I said, from, from as soon as the land land has been um, secured by the developer, we start we start start the journey together with them. And um, and I mean a lot of developments and developers judge uh, or not judge um, take whatever the agent says and build that into their feasibilities, and that's what makes the development work or not. 
So it's not just a thumb suck to say this is a part that you can sell for 20,000 Rand a square. If you, the developer takes you on on that and the risk that you also take in marketing and your marketing cost and budget um, is all on risk for this developer together with, with you as the sales agent um, earning your commissions. So no, we, we have to be very involved from day one um, to, to secure that development is successful. Awesome. Thanks, Scott. So you brought up something there, which is um, you obviously as a, as a developer in general, um, you're either buying a piece of land or you're buying a property. Um, and I was going to go over to Andre here. Is, um, Andre, in terms of buying a piece of land, um, you obviously have to structure your agreements correctly to make sure that you can firstly secure that land, but also you don't want to um, expose yourself to risk. So what is the ideal stru- uh, structure for land purchase agreements? Uh, thanks, Grant. Okay, so firstly, why I think this is vitally important is for two reasons. I believe we are in, in quite a, what's the word, uh, a recession that's going to come up in our market and economic pressure will create a lot of opportunities in land purchase agreements. So I foresee quite a lot of those kind of opportunities coming over my desk in the coming months. And uh, that obviously is the one important aspect. The other aspect is it is the start of your development process. You need to secure your rights as the developer. And I've also seen a lot of times where people start with all this time and effort and they're actually not entirely protected in terms of the land purchase agreement. So firstly, for those two reasons, it is a very important thing to consider. One Aspect is obviously the one, the first and most obvious way to structure it is to just do a normal offer to purchase. That is the way that you will probably close the most deals because obviously the guy that's selling the land wants his money sooner rather than later. So you'll have a lot of negotiating power. If you've got some funding, don't f- try and focus obviously on, on within your funding space and try and rather secure the deal if you have the funding and get the land into your vehicle uh, that you want to develop in, which I will get to a bit later in terms of structure. Then the, the an, another very important aspect to consider is also some, something I see quite a lot is that the there's a lot of the time people speculating in a company to be formed or trust to be formed, etc., where firstly they bind themselves a surety in those uh, offer to purchase if it does not proceed. Um, and secondly, it is quite risky because you, uh, you need to form that company very quick to avoid double transfer duty uh, penalties or, or uh, assessments from SARS. So I always advise my clients, look, it's easy for me to register a quick company even without a name, it's just quick, just get it done and contract in the entity that's already in existence. So on that point, I've got the normal OTP, um, the, the existing entity relays or flows through to all the other structures. It's very important to have it in place from the beginning. And the second one is obviously a well-known one of uh, offer to purchase with a delayed or conditions precedent clause, which is normally due diligence, finance, etc. It's a very handy type of structure. However, you must just be careful if it runs too long. SARS might want to see transfer duty payable within six months and you could get penalties if the wording is not correct in that contract. And the last one which I start using more often these days is to rather do an option on a piece of land which get triggered by certain suspensive conditions. And uh, while you simultaneously with the option agreement, you sign the offer to purchase that will get triggered, but you split the documents, you don't refer to them within one another. So you have the security if the option is triggered that you can just execute your OTP as well. And the option then sort of falls away. You take the cover off and you throw it away and you've got a secured offer to purchase that gets triggered on that specific date, which you also date on on signature. So that's more or less the three broad stroke uh, types of structures to secure the land. Um, There are other ones as well, more risky ones, um, but those are the ones I normally prefer to to give advice on to clients. In the development series, I can elaborate more on on other options. Cool. So um, just quick on those three options, do you recommend that a generic agreement is used or do you sort of spend time with your attorney on each of those, um, with each agreement or each specific deal to make sure that those are properly structured, even the three generic or the three 
initial um, structures? Look, Grant, I think like a property development is a big project. So there's in the end hundreds of millions normally that gets flowed to and fro. So I always suggest let's rather consult, get the agreement right from the beginning um, so you don't have problems later on. So with all my clients, I make sure, look, certain aspects are generic with any, any contracts, but there are certain things that need to be tailor-made for the specific transaction. Grant, just to, just, to, just to add to that, Grant, um, even, even with smaller deals, whether it's one house or two houses or three houses, you know, you, all your risk of the project is, is usually tied up in how you structure that initial agreement. So it's such a vital, vital thing to get right. Um, so absolutely don't even use generic agreements because it's just risk. Uh, somebody like Andre is there to look after mitigating his client's risk, just from my perspective. That's okay. Thank you. Yeah, and I mean, I, and, and I agree, you know, everything comes down to the contract um, and, and part two is also building a relationship with your team. So having an attorney that understands overall not only what you're trying to achieve within your deal, but also your property investment strategy. And uh, I think, um, Andre, that's some of the space that you work in well is understanding an overall strategy and how this one deal aligns with the overall strategy to structure correctly as well. Correct. Yeah. Awesome. Brilliant. Cool. And then um, something Skulk mentioned um, earlier was uh, Razik working with uh, with uh, somebody, one of your associates in terms of visualizing and looking at a, a development, seeing what it's going to actually look like. But then also, I mean, what's the uh, architects or professional architects um, involvement in the development? Um, you know, why are they really required? Yeah, that's quite a, a loaded question, but I would say without being too biased, uh, the architect plays one of the, a professional architect plays one of the most critical roles within the team, um, especially within terms of, of risk management, and essentially that's what it's all about. Um, in, in all developments, the, the real goal, aside from sales, is the su successful completion of a building um, and achieving occupancy to allow that sale to go through. Um, and that occupancy achieved on time and in budget. Um, and looking at it from that point of view, the architect really is, uh, within the built environment, a critical role player. Um, if I think of, of the recommendations required from the architect, from, from the inception, there's an enormous amount of risk um, that, that, that builds on to what the architect put forward as a recommendation. And as a professional, uh, that risk is covered by indemnity insurance. Uh, and it is critical, I would say, very important that uh, all entities within a development space deals with professionals um, and deals with the correct professionals. Now, if we look at, uh, in terms of what the actual architect's role is, um, aside from uh, the lead consultant, he's really the catalyst and the driver of the process. Um, you know, people mistakenly think that uh, the architect is only responsible for drawing pictures or drawing plans, but, uh, but that is definitely very short-sighted and, and, and misunderstood. I mean, aside from the drawing, there's unpacking uh, and interpreting the property development rights um, and defining potential. Um, and that then the potential is tested up against um, an entity like Skulk. Um, and immediately uh, there's, there's, there's a discussion up front between the developer, the, the agent, and uh, uh, Andre, the attorney, because we can't actually uh, commence unless there's a secured uh, uh, deal in place to minimize risk, which is which it's all about. Um, but then moving forward, uh, the, uh, the architect is knowledge of building typologies, um, and understanding constraints and then designing in the end something that maximizes the development potential because essentially that's what development is about. Um, it's about maximum yield um, and that's understanding the, the maximum development potential of a property. Um, and that's already in a mouthful and I'm not even halfway through the responsibilities of the architect. Um, keep going, we're responsible for, for programming, um, Lead consultant is team coordination. Uh, a team can be anywhere from five professionals to 12 professionals. Um, sitting on part of your team is the developer, uh, the estate agent, always guiding what, what, what this product is going to be in the end. Um, but we have to essentially make that something uh, that's buildable um, and an end product that's achievable. 
Um, but then going forward with this budget control, understanding budget so that from the beginning, uh, the, the product that the developer and the agent have, have now agreed, we now need to make that product into something that is a bulk form. Uh, and then looking forward into the planning, there's securing rights through the SDP. Um, further to that is council approval and securing plan submission or, or plan approval. Um, and then getting into choosing of the contractor and prepping uh, drawings, taking something that's very conceptual into something that's going to be built by a contractor that can be costed by a QS. Um, there's an enormous amount of risk and responsibility uh, that falls on our shoulders. Um, so, as I said, uh, my recommendation is to get a skilled professional that, that can guide you through this process. Um, and then eventually we get to site, which is, I would say, the, the, the cherry on top for the architect. We get to site and there's roughly about 12, 14 months that we're on site. And we then see it through to the completion of that project. Uh, the build, we manage how the building, make sure that the contract is interpreting the drawings um, and the idea and the vision of the developer and the agent um, and making sure that that vision is translated into the build form. And then finally, achieving occupancy, where we then negotiate with the municipality and say that the plans that we've drawn that the contract has built is exactly as per your approval. And I would say then that is the full lifespan of 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 uh, the uh, process why yeah, we are needed all. in a nutshell. In a nutshell, in a nutshell. Uh, quick, quick one for everybody. Um, STP. Uh, what does that stand for? Not ST, it's SDP, which is Site Development Plan. In, in all properties, in a development situation, uh, you would need, you wouldn't just go straight to plan approval. You would, it's basically a summary of the idea which you send to land use management where they would say that your site is adequately suited and your rights are in place. And usually from this point on, Skulk and myself and the developer would mold this thing into the vision and product. Um, and we would then be able to legally go to market with with um, with the development. Cool. And then you refer to a QS, just again for everybody, a QS. Sorry for my for the jargon, the built environment jargon. Uh, quant the QS is uh, Quanti Surveyor. He is a uh, developer's uh, left-hand man. Um, he makes sure that whatever we design uh, basically is in his budget and in terms of the viability that we've proven upfront. Cool. And we've got a quick question here from somebody saying, um, from limited understanding, um, the role does seem to overlap with the QS from your description, if you could just clarify. Um, in, the, in the built environment, you, the QS and architect, okay, QS is about numbers, architect is about the build format, design and regulation space. Quantity survey is all about numbers and costing. A uh, quantity surveyor, in, in some instances, is the principal agent in, in certain projects, but more likely the architect would be the principal agent, and that is the only the only role where we would overlap. Otherwise, um, you would find the quantity surveyor, uh, the, the architect, as the lead. Yeah, awesome. So I think it's also important to note that there is always going to be an overlap between professionals within any any team, and it's important that there is that overlap. Um, you, know, you can't have a singular view on on uh, a part of a build that um, that uh, you know, that somebody else can put, at least give input into, and um, there needs to be that overlap to make sure there's no gaps in your professional team. So there will be an overlap between, for example, the architect, the developer, and the QS, um, most certainly. Um, same as there will be an overlap between uh, the developer and, uh, for example, Andre and Skulk in terms of their positions in terms uh, on the development side. Um, so, to go to a question we have from Tamron for you, Razek, just saying, do architects normally submit the plan for approval, even a small one or two house developments or, um, or renovations? In a development instance, uh, if it is rezoning, uh, we, we required you would get a planner. If it's a, a majorly complex environment, you're doing rezonings, you would get a, a planner on board, you would make the, the planning portion submission. But building plans is always done by a professional architect. Um, or a professional draftsman, but in in extensions, draftsmen, professional draftsmen, registered draftsmen, they can make submissions. But in large developments, um, a professional architect would make that submission. Grant, maybe just to to add to that, Grant. Obviously, um, you know, a development, whether it's a, 
a two or three house development or 100 unit development, the timeline can be anything from 12 to 14 months to 24 to 30 months. And obviously, there's various role players on each stage of the development, and everybody works together and it intertwines, but you can't go to stage four if you haven't done stage one. So it's quite a long, complicated process to understand. And so I think there's, there's some of the questions that the guys are asking that we'll definitely be dealing in with a series where Ross is going to get into a lot of detail around how the professional team works together, how the architect works with the QS and with the developer, et cetera. Because um, it, is, it is quite a long and detailed process. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I can just jump in here and just talk about typically, typically the, the professional team so everyone can understand what, what sort of team we would be leading to assist the developer to achieve his outcome. Okay. Um, so, so it's, role plays is quite, quite, quite. I would say very important in a development, specifically from a bank financing. So, your professional, a strong professional team will definitely help you through uh, and, and get uh, get that required financing. Obviously, your project needs to be viable, um, but also in terms of risk management and, and and budget control. You know, the knowledge base needs to be there so that we can. Uh, not waste time. Wasting time is a major, major fund. Uh, 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 how can I say? It, it just extracts so much fund, funds if we waste too much time. Um, and it also depends on uh, on the scale and the complexity of a project. But typically, you would we would have the architect as a lead and working very closely with him as a quantity surveyor. Then up front, you would work with a land surveyor. I would always recommend that you have a land surveyor, work with the correct information, get the surveyor out there to tell you exactly what's happening on the site. Um, in very complex uh, situations where you need some rezoning done, or which I never say you do, you require departures, you would get a planner in. Um, and then if it's in the Western Cape, you've got a, a heritage is a major issue here. And if for some reason you've got a property that you would like to develop and it's got heritage aspects, I would say get a heritage practitioner in. But then the typical ones would be structural engineer, your silver engineer, your electrical engineer, your mechanical engineer, your electronics engineer, which shouldn't be mixed up with electrical because electronics is more the specific stuff, your alarm systems, your access controls, your cameras, or all of that, which is very uh, specialist. You've got your fire engineer, you've got your wet services, and then you've got your health and safety officer. So you can see that there's a number of role players within a, a development. I would say all of these role players, if it's 10 million and upwards, you're looking at all of these role, role players. Um, so the majority of projects, uh, it's a sizable team. Oh, thank you, Rosic. It's, uh, it sounds like it could be quite complex and quite hectic uh, running a development. So. Yeah, Paul, it's uh, very complex. I mean, and I think, again, it sort of reiterates why it's so important to have the right people involved. Quick one, Razak, and uh, just my thought here. An, an architect's an architect, surely. Uh, you know, one architect is just as good as another. Um, or, or is that not true for um, development? It's not true in development. Um, uh, some architects are very skilled and they niche. Now, with developments, the, the end result is the, the building. Now, architects can build, uh, but can they unlock development the maximum development potential. And in order to do that, you need to be, poor, poor, I would say, part planner, part architect. And that comes from many years of, 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 of testing. Uh, so it's a specific architect that you're looking for. Um, and there are many of them out there. Uh, just make sure that uh, he, he's, they've got the, the, the necessary skills. Awesome. I think to add to, add to that grant, yeah. um, just, just to add to what Razik says there, I mean, there's many lawyers out there, there's many estate agents out there, um, you know, but you've got to, you know, the right team is so important. If you have the wrong team, it can be a, a potentially a fantastic project, but for the wrong team, there's massive risk in terms of your project failing. Um, so it's absolutely key to have the architect with the right skill set, as with an agent and, and an attorney. And obviously, as, as everyone can, yeah, these, these three role players in terms of their entities are some of the core, um, some of the core team members you'd need as a developer. Um, and I see Paul Adams has, uh, said, yeah, it sounds complex. So anything you haven't done before is normally complex. And that's why we want to share with you guys and do the course for those that are, that are keen to learn more. And it's like anything in life. Once you, once you go through the process and you do it often enough, you understand it, then, then it's not complex anymore. Um, but um, I'd like to just, um, uh, Got a question for Scott, because obviously, I think from our experience, having a, a real estate agent on board from the outset, 
it's important that, that they understand investment and why it's important for their clients to invest. I mean, anybody who's selling something needs to believe that it's a good investment. So, I mean, Scott, maybe you can give us some perspective on, on why property is a good investment from your side. Yeah, rightly so. I mean, once again, we get, we get appointed um, on behalf of the developer, but I think from as far as the development is and the contact between the consumer and the developer, we are the middleman. So for us to be able to do that, one, I need to be very, very positive about the project. Um, not only because I can sell it, but um, there's a big risk for me if this development does not come off. And obviously for my developer as well. And that has a re huge reputational repercussions in, in, in the future. Um, so from our perspective, um, I need to sell a development as a property that can unlock value for the investor or alternative for the person that's moving in there. That, that's going to be a property where him and his family can live and, and grow into. So... Um, the saying of an uh, early bird catches the worm um, comes to mind here. A number of developments, especially your bigger developments, if we're talking your 50 to 100 to 200 million developments, um, are built in phases. Um, and we have realized in the past that the, the initial investors, the guys that come in first, um, that they've experienced growth, capital growth on those specific unit which they bought in the first phase. Um, with regards to that same specific unit, just on another space in the development, um, of between 15 to 20 percent. As um, Franchot mentioned earlier, some developments can can go for 12 months; others goes up to three, four years. I mean, if you look at a big development like Satari, um, or um, what's the other big one in Somerset Lakes? I mean, those projects are in five, six, seven years. So the Oaks who came in first are definitely um, the guys who's going to make the money, um, and then also. Why developments? Um, a lot of developers, you don't need to normally pay the 10% deposit. A lot of development, the, the developers are in a position um, that they can bank for, or bankroll it um, with, a, with a small deposit of a, of a 50,000 Rand deposit, uh, which you won't get normally at a, at a house. Um, your seller, seller at a normal consumer to consumer sale um, wants that 10%. He wants to know that the guy is in a financial um, position to, to buy the property and to close the deal. Um, another interesting thing from an investor per point of view, why it's good for him to rather buy in development than buy into an existing estate. Um, if you buy, obviously there's, 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 a, there's a VAT implication. Hello, yeah. Most de de most developers are registered for, for VAT. So if you buy it, and Andre can come in with the structures, structures again. Um, can you hear me where? From Sorry, I'll just... Uh, so somebody needs to be muted there. So again, yeah, if you buy in a VAT-registered entity, that VAT is claim, you can claim that VAT back um, as, an input, as an input cost, which um, lowers the, your your capital expenditure quite a lot and brings your rental yields up quite high. Um, then also, it's a, it's a new property that you're buying. So there's, there's limited maintenance for at least five to 10 years. These properties are guaranteed by, by the builders who's registered with the NHBRC and all of that. So it, it, it's your investment is much safer than a dilapidated building or building that you're not sure if there is any, any errors in the, in the construction of that material, um, material construction of the building. And then the last thing, um, and it's, it's quite a new thing with regards to developers, and your bigger developers um, can probably give these things out more, more easily than your, your, your smaller developers. And that's the great thing of what's called the rental guarantee. Um, so what, what in fact this means is when you buy the property um, and let's say it's, a, it's, a joint, it's an apartment and not like a big house um, residential home, but more your sexual title apartments, um, they give a rental guarantee of up to one, uh, up to two years. So once you've purchased the property, you're already secured of an income for at least two years. And if you don't get an income, I mean, the developer pays you that amount. So those are the, some of the nice things from an investor's point of view, why they rather look at developments than looking at um, your normal consumer to consumer sale. Awesome. Thanks, Scott. Um, cool. Yeah, and, and, and I think the reality is, is property investments into the right spaces with the right advice and, and, and backing the right developer is also vitally important. Um, just something that was mentioned earlier was, was you know, the risk of, of getting into space. So 
being a developer is highly risky, and that's why we're recommending obviously you get with a professional team that understand the space, understand uh, the risks, but also have got experience. And, and that's why Francis spends, um, I imagine, quite a lot of time being quite specific in terms of, of building his professional under you as a, as the attorney, you know what is the right structure to structure your development um, from a, an entity point of view? Is it your own name? Do you need to you know what is this, the right structure to sort of uh, uh, limit the risks? Thanks, Grant. Okay, so most of the time, um, as with anything, there are quite a lot of options out there, and it depends. Also, do you have the option uh, to to have all the options in front of you. But I'm, I'm just going to elaborate on, on my ideal type of scenario would definitely be to, you normally have your development holding company, which shares are then obviously hold in the form of a trust, which is also better for business continuity and estate planning. And every single development that you go into, you register a new company, like I said in the beginning. In that company, you, you purchase the, the land and you start the development process in that company. And you ring fence every development deal in a specific new entity being registered, held by your development hold co. And it gives you the option to joint venture with other developers and other partners in that specific ring fenced entity. One thing that I've obviously seen quite a lot, and this is not necessarily a development mistake, this is more a commercial legal mistake, and it, it brings me back to the beginning why it is important to just consult with your attorney when you put the deal together, is that a lot of people sort of hold their equity, their personal partnership, plus joint ventures and property and everything together in one company, which is quite a mixed pot. And all of those relationships are regulated by different terms, and it can create a very, very messy scenario, specifically if something goes wrong, uh, because that's normally where attorneys start to, to unfortunately get briefed, and they should rather maybe get briefed in the beginning to try and avoid the pitfalls and the issues. Yeah. Um, so from my side, definitely the most holistic um, and, and just in general structure would be trust, old co ring fence company for one development because every development as well has got different terms and different structures, different partners, different funding models. Awesome. So cool. That's again, seems to be a conversation where it's a relationship uh, conversation with your attorney versus uh, like you say, um, when, when um, things start hitting the fan. Um, so quite important. Uh, that you have that relationship with your your attorney as well in terms of your structuring. Um, question, question we had here was um, Carlos was asking um, from, and this is all the professional uh, partners, would you get involved in a development uh, for sweat equity or are there other creative ways to get you guys involved in development or is it purely on a, on a rand and cents basis? So if I can answer that, Grant, I think there's, I mean, I'm involved with, with some projects where, uh, where it's sweat equity. So it, it really depends on the value that you can add. I think the best way um, to, to really, let's say, for example, you don't necessarily have the capital, but if you sit with somebody like Andre, there's ways that you can secure an, an opportunity where you're in control and you're in a good position to then bring, you know, whether it's a professional team or a co-developer or anybody else on board. Um, where you can get them to put the finance in or, you know, some of the skills in, as as you said, with sweat equity. So I think on a, it's definitely an option. It will be a deal dependent and it will also be dependent on what's the, what's the, you know, required to be put into, into the deal versus, versus the upside. Um, but it is possible, yes. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, Francois. And then a uh, qu question for you, Francois, actually, Tamron asking, uh, how is the development process different when you redevelop a existing building to development from uh, just land and then building on that? So the short answer is, um, you know, it depends on the building. So how long is a piece of string? Um, in, in principle, if you think about it, if you've got a property, the one is an empty piece of land, the other one's got a structure on it. Now going through the process with Skulk, et cetera, and with Razik, understanding what, what do you want to do with it, you still need to go through that process because you have to redevelop it. It's not a new building, but it's still a redevelopment. So you still need to understand, can I do with this building that I want to do with it and is it compliant and will it get approved? You probably will still need to submit an SDP, you still need to go to the market 
um, oftentimes there's more risk with existing buildings because you don't really you can't really do an audit of the building completely so you might get some you, you probably will get some surprises when you go to construction so, i mean for example working with rosic and the qs we would definitely with an existing building allow a much bigger contingency because we know we will probably get some surprises so there's um it might be a little bit of a um you know not as intense design um in terms of a new build but more or less the same process, just different risks that one needs to be aware of. And I think if you do go that route, try and try and bring somebody on board who's done it before, um, who understands where the footfalls are, specifically with, with uh, redeveloping an existing building. The process is the same, similar risks, but also some different risks that you don't get with new builds. Yeah, I think so. So I think I, I think that leads quite nicely to Paul's question here about. Sounds like the barriers to entry are huge, and he's um, pointing that towards Skulk. But I think it's a question any any of you guys can answer is is it sounds like the barriers to entry and and our student property developments are huge, um, and he's assuming that the process and requirements differ based on the size of the development. I don't think the process differs depending on the size of the development. It's just going to be the resources you bring to the party. But um, uh, barriers to entry huge in terms of getting to property development. Um, anyone? So I'll I'll quickly just give my two cents, and the other guys can can add add what their thoughts are because obviously they work with other developers as well. Um, so initially starting out, there's there's two things that are really important. You need to be able to identify an opportunity. So you don't need massive amounts of capital to put it put the right team together and to go start looking for opportunities, but you need to build a certain skill set in order to understand when it is a really good opportunity. There's ways to tie opportunities and to have control legally without physically putting any cash down. Then secondly, you know, you don't have to use your own money. I started off with getting a partner on board and we had a, a certain you know, pot of cash that we worked with and we started our first six house development with that. So start small. You don't have to start big. You can start with two or three units. So I think the, the, barri the barriers to entry is, if you say the barri barriers to entry is big, I think your biggest challenge would be just building the knowledge. And I think there's a great opportunity here to start building a foundation with the base of that knowledge required. Yeah, and if I could just come in there, um, I think this is exactly what um, Francho mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, is that I think the younger generation is more open to, to sharing ideas and doing joint ventures than our predecessors um, and a conversation like this introduces you to to a lot of people um, like-minded people and with with the, with different um, one skill sets and two different resources so obviously I, I believe this is the reason why I also joined today's conversation is to share information and to make sure that like-minded people sit around the same table and eventually works towards the same goal and dream of becoming a property developer or adding value to a property developer and becoming part of a property development. Yeah, thanks, Kolk. And I think, um, you know, Nigel has also commented on the chat. Um, uh, Nigel, Adrian, sir, um, you know, the, your first barrier to entry, which I agree with, is understanding and knowledge and your second is capital. But with understanding and knowledge, you can find and close the right deal with a good agent, a good architect, and a good attorney, without capital, you can find, identify the right deal and close it legally with the right structure, which Andre has got the knowledge on. And then if you've got the right, if you've got the right deal, there's a lot of guys out there looking for opportunities with capital. So that's the easy one. Finding the money is not the difficult part. That's, that's sort of the, the, if you've got the right deal, the money will come. Well, um, question here from uh, uh, Conrad asking, how will the new or upcoming Property Practitioners Act affect developers um, going forward. Now, um, Property Practitioners Act relates to um, effective estate agents and the Estate Agents Affairs Board has, or, or the Act, so they it's extended its touch or, or its, um, its uh, control from not only being estate agents, but pretty much anybody involved in the property, uh, sale of property um, or, or the property process itself. So even mortgage orig originators are at some level uh, going to be a sort of ring fence into that act. Um, from what I'm aware, and you guys can correct me, but the Pro Property Practitioners Act has specifically excluded developers from its ambit. Um, I don't know if uh, Skulk or, or France or any of you guys sort of have got more insight. 
I think, look, we, as, as a developer, um, we've got to make sure that, that our team's compliant, but we don't personally, other than the NHPRC, we don't need to be registered with, with the Act. Um, Andre and Skalk, your comments? No, look, I think Grant's 100%. Yes. Okay, Andre, you can go. I think, personally, uh, it, it won't affect the, the normal processes of a developer. The only thing that, that it might affect is there might be an arguable point of certain uh, registration and a bit more red tape in terms of regulation. But obviously the ambit of the Act is more aimed towards state agents than these ancillary services that, that's going to be also try to be regulated. So from my understanding, it's not going to affect what we're discussing today really. Uh, it, might, it might be just, like I say, a bit more... Uh, registration processes. Yeah, so we've got we got to make sure that Skulk's compliant. That's the big thing. Skulk, please be compliant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, our body, please. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, the, the, it's also we've just got to make sure it's um, the Properties Practitioners Act, um, as with a number of our acts in South Africa. There's so many loopholes um, that it opens up to. I mean, when the National Credit Act came into existence it's it changed the whole financing system but it also opens a lot of opportunities um and that's where clever guys like andre um and accountants and all of those they find loopholes in these acts i also think um, there is going to be a number of um, issues that the um the new eab board will have um once once again, the government has been slow to implement anything yeah um the committees hasn't been formed nothing nothing is where it should be. And I believe it's going to be quite quite a while before that comes into existence um, and actually be enforced. Mm. So for the time being, um, yes, take note of what, what it states. But um, And once again, yes, it is more aimed at estate agent. But I mean, the, the definition of a property practitioner is, is so wide that it basically includes everyone in the world that has anything to do with a, pro- with a, prop- with a deal in property and some attorneys have gone as far as to say, should their um, conveyancing secretaries register as a pro- property practitioner? So um, I'm, I'm not too concerned about the effects of what it will have on us currently. Um, and I mean, the EAAB is in such a state currently, um, I can only see what the properties practitioners bill is, is going to be pretty much the same as just a different name. Yeah, no, I, I agree. But I think I think you know, um, in doing anything, you need to be uh, aware of regulation and what's going to happen um, as as you go forward. So I think it's important to to just keep uh, abreast of any uh, legislation coming through through the fold. Um, you know, whether it's Property Practitioners Act or or anything else that relates to your your business um, and regardless of your business development or you know selling tomatoes you know you need to be aware of regulations so you maintain and stay within those guidelines to make sure that you've got a viable business going forward so regardless of what the acts are I've got a question here around um uh, the SPLUMA, so spatial planning and land use management act how does that affect the the, man, the the development process i don't want to dig too much into into it but has it had an effect guys on on the development process um, um no? let, let me jump into that um cool. So it's in, in most ways, so uh, recently we've just seen uh, uh, the, the Act be up, updated and the zoning uh, has, has in some ways got a lot better um, and is in support of densification. And densification is really what, uh, what uh, the developer is all about, you know, uh, maximizing on the development potential of a property is about densification. Um, so in some ways, it's got better. Uh, for instance, uh, the single dwelling now went from single to double to triple dwelling on, in some instances. Uh, parking has, has reduced, and those are the two major players, you know, uh, within the zoning scheme. Um, parking versus, versus amount of bulk, uh, that really tells you your potential, and, and, and both of those really have got, got gotten better. So from my point of view, uh, the regulations are dating from from an architect. We from the professional team. We're watching obviously building regulations, and we're watching zoning regulations. Um, so, so there's a. I would say, at this point, it it it, it suits the developer. 
Awesome. Cool. Yeah, and I think, I think again, you know, from what, what I've been seeing coming out of a lot of the bylaws, um, particularly in Cape Town, is that the municipalities and the planning uh, officers are very aware of the need to densify. Um, and France and I discussed um, uh, quite in detail last on the last call on the opportunity around densification, not only in densifying on residential units, but densifying within residential units, looking at communes, looking at um, professional communes, which are still feel is one of the biggest opportunities for developers um, and new developers uh, uh, moving to the space for the next few years, uh, next two to three years, uh, more so now than ever because of uh, we all the, the fact that pretty much all 96 people on this call are sitting at home right now and aren't allowed to leave their, their, uh, their properties. That's one of the biggest reasons why um, densification uh, communes, professional communes, is going to be a huge uh, um, opportunity uh, going forward. And again, the municipalities and the planning officers are coming to the party, like you say, Razak, with the identification and the parking being a big one. Can I, can I just jump in there? Uh, one of the, uh, what's, what's, what's very popular at the moment and on the tips of everyone's tongue is student housing. Um, I can just give some word of caution. Um, make sure that you're the correct zoning is in place before you do any sort of modifications to units or buildings for the need of, 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 of student housing, it comes with specific regulations. Uh, it re requires specific zoning, um, and uh, universities also require specific requirements for uh, on the performance of these buildings. Um, so approach it with caution um, and make sure that you 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 start that venture off correctly. Awesome, thank you. Um, so here, quick, and I think this is for Andre. Um, so from a development point of view, how do you mitigate the risk legally when partnering with a developer, um, assuming the developer will be able to use their own attorneys going forward? So um, if you're investing in the development. Um, okay, so it's, that's quite a broad question uh, because risk, to mitigate risk, is a, is a specific instance. But uh, if I can give a broad brushstroke answer, uh, what I would assume is the question is phased around you securing a good deal and you have the team and the, the let's call it the knowledge aspect in place, but you lack the funding. So I assume, and I'm going to answer the question from that perspective, and now you're trying to partner with a big property developer with a track record that the banks will view favorably um, to partner with and get this thing over the line. Um, I would say, look, I mean, it is, it is quite difficult. Normally, you're going, definitely going to be, in most instances, the, the minority shareholder because the developer will bring his balance sheet. Um, he will take a lot of surety risk normally. And, and it is fair that he, is, um, he gets the lion's share of the equity and the profits in the development. That being said, um, you won't be able to do it without him. Um, so it is a it, it it is a scenario where first and foremost outside of the the legal framework you need to be at ease with the person that you're dealing with, uh, and always there's something in life called gut feel, and that is a very important thing which I believe in in business decisions is you need to listen to that point before you even look at the contractual the legal side of it. Is there a commercial chemistry between? you and and this specific partner because it, this partner will probably take the control in the entity that you've built up and and rightly so because he brings or takes on most of the risk but having said that there's a few things you can mitigate the one thing is to ensure that certain decisions and voting rights that you are involved in them that's going to uh, affect certain critical decisions in devco um, that is something you normally do and you have to stipulate in your joint venture and shareholders agreements. You need to regulate how loan accounts can be called up. Uh, that's very important because that's normally a thing where people try and, and put pressure on a minority shareholder. And um, lastly, obviously, just make sure that certain things which minority shareholders always normally get a bit of a, a, a bad hit on the head is if the profit share scenarios are not exactly well stipulated. So you need to benchmark profit share against a fixed aspect like the bank approved feasibility because if the person having control over the company 
has all the control. They control the income and the expenses, and that can be manipulated to a point where you thought you're going to get profit of a million rand, and in the end, it's 50,000 rand. And I've seen all of these different aspects in, in my litigation practice in the past. And I mean, Skulk, you would also have seen that a lot. So in general, that for me is quite a sort of broad discussion. But again, um, to mitigate risk, it's every specific instance is different. And I need to understand the full picture of the transaction to, uh, to really mitigate every important aspect of the risk. So, um, yeah. In, in a nutshell, that's my answer. It's quite a nutshell. Awesome. <laughs> it's quite a nutshell again. Yeah. I mean, there's so much detail to this. And I think, again, it, it sort of links back to the fact that we're going to run this um, a 12 episode series on, on getting into property development, digging into more detail on each aspect that we were discussing here briefly today, but also that it's an important. You build a relationship with your professional or your, or your experts in each part of the development um, space to make sure that you walk in the walk and in, in, in the entire journey with uh, the right people that can give the right advice from from a, a base or foundation of, of the right experience. So I think that's vitally important. Andre, while you're um, sort of warmed up there nicely, quick one: um, what's the conveyances involvement in uh, development? Okay, so. Obviously, the conveyancing attorney plays a critical role. I call it, the, let's call it the bank in the developer. The trust accounts of the conveyancing attorney holds the funds. Uh, normally, it depends. Sometimes funds may be held by the, the, uh, in trust by the estate agency. It depends on the, on the commercial structure that the developer has with, with the specific estate agency or, or his or her attorney. But normally, I mean, that they hold the wallet in the development. So it is a very, uh, again, very important that you choose the right one. Again, with the same, what I call business chemistry, it needs to be somebody that you get along with well and with a track record and that understands the development process. Because the, uh, the like I say, that wallet, if you venture towards the end of the development and you get to the end user contracts and the end user transfer off of the units, you can imagine what that development bond looks like and what that development interest per day is on your development company and somebody, either you or your partner, standing surety for that. If there is a big mess up right at the end, it can totally kill the development. So it needs to be a, a very well-qualified person with the track record that controls that process and, and make sure that end-user transfers happen as quickly as and efficiently as possible. Awesome. Brilliant. Thanks, Andre. Um, and then while I've got you, um, you know, we're talking about developments and a lot of the schemes and identification is going to be around sectional title. Um, do you need a sectional title expert for the initial setup? And that's the setup of the, section, the scheme register and the rules, or is that something the attorney does? Yeah, I would suggest that the conveyancing attorney gets involved in that process from the beginning and make sure that that, that is dealt with, with with the conveyancer that you're partnering with. Even if it's just your identification with the three sections on your own property or a 200-unit sectional title scheme, again, um, get your professional involved. In that instance, the professional is the conveyancer. So... Don't, don't try and shop in the wrong areas. Uh, there are professionals out there for a reason. And in a development, it is, uh, I've seen the comments earlier, it's, it sounds complex. It, it is complex, but in the end, there's a lot of, there's a professional for every field, a professional for every field in a development. Make sure you get the right guys in that every field of it. And then it, it, it makes it really a lot less complex. Brilliant. Awesome. Grant, so, I can uh, just add to that um, from our experience as well in being in the conveyancing area for quite a number of years while I was a lawyer, is from a property developer's point of view and specifically someone coming in new, all they think is they think lawyer and they think fees. Um, what is a nice thing that most attorneys do is because they get their fee uh, predominantly paid by the purchaser if it's not included in the purchase price. And if it is included in the purchase price, they've absorbed that into the price already. So they've made a provision for it. Is a lot of attorneys will, the sexual title risk, the, the development agreements, all of that, they will do that on risk, subject to that they do get appointed as the transferring attorneys for, um, for the project, and then they get their fees from the registration of transfer. 
Um, so I just think, once again, barrier to entry, there are ways of getting around it by using proper professionals that's been in the industry, does have a little bit of bank balance and can fund this until such time as, um, as the registration comes and they did get their fees. Yeah, uh, I think that, I think that's vitally important. So again, somebody experience, and you mentioned something. Somebody that's got a, a running a viable business that's already done it, versus going for the discount kings, where you might uh, realize that the discounts um, not something that's really providing with, with the right expertise. Um, quick, Rosic, I've got a question here, and I, and I know it's sort of phased incorrectly, and I'd like you to correct for me. And um, Tamron asking here, would you need this this versus a subdividing, which would then need a sectional title scheme. Um, that's a question from Tamron, um, just related to... Uh, can, can you repeat that? Uh, uh, so, so it's a sort of a follow-on from um, requiring a sectional title expert to help register a scheme and, and rules. Tamron's asking, would you need the setup, being the expert, to help you with, uh, with densification versus subdividing, which would then need a sectional title scheme? So first okay. point, maybe I'm just going to try and yeah. make sense of it. Um, so basically, yeah, cool. there's two. Uh, these are not smaller, smaller developments, but there's either subdivision or there's a sectional title scheme. Now, let's take for instance the new regulations with regards to single dwellings now being able to do triple dwellings. In that instance, you wouldn't need to subdivide. You would create a sectional scheme, and you can sell them off individually. Uh, you could subdivide, but subdivision is a very long process and it is, uh, it's restricted. Your title deeds, uh, sp specific areas have limited uh, size rest restrictions, the entire uh, Atlantic seaboard, you know, Bishop's Court, the Constantius, all the old environments, uh, they, don't, uh, they don't allow for subdivision. So uh, with this new regulation coming into place, the triple dwelling, the sectional title scheme is perfect for that environment. Yeah. And you me you mentioned something there on time frame. Um, time frame subdivision takes a long time, where sectional title scheme is is relatively quick, um, comparatively, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, look, uh, a subdivision like rezoning, it, it, you know, it's it's a multiple process, multiple uh, professionals involved. Um, it becomes a, a it steps into the legal realm, then goes into the deeds office, uh, you know, then into the S, uh, the, the SG environment. Um, so. It's a complex, complex, complex uh, set of, of requirements for subdivision. Not impossible, uh, it just requires time. Fantastic. Cool. Um, yeah, so I mean, we're heading towards the end of the, the hour and 15. It's sort of flown by. Uh, I think we probably spend another three hours just talking about this if we really wanted to. Um, if I could maybe ask each of you just maybe one, one tip or one sort of piece of advice you can give to somebody that's starting out of the development. Um, Maybe start with uh, with you, Scott. Yeah, I think um, it's very important um, to make sure from from our point of view and where we probably get asked to get, be part of the development is to make sure that it is viable. And a project is only viable if someone is willing to buy that properties or those properties that you are selling. So from our point of view, market research is very, very important. A lot of people think, oh, this is a nice ground to put up an apartment block. Um, however, there's a reason why there aren't any other apartment blocks in that area. One can be the zoning, all of that. But two is probably because it's not conducive to it. So always before, once you've seen a potential point of um, piece of land, go to the experts, go to Arazi, go to the architect, see if the rezoning for what you want to do is possible. And if that is indeed the case, go to a property ex or your estate agent in that area that knows the area well and see what will sell there. And, and then after you can see what can sell and for what price they can sell, then obviously you start with your feasibilities to make sure that you can make a profit out of the development. Brilliant. Razik? Okay, I uh, don't want to sound, sound like I'm repeating, but uh, it's, it's hugely important that you start the project correctly. So it's all about the right team. And it's, it's in order to start it properly and build on your team, you guys, uh, we, you need to rely on each other. So you're wasting each other's time. Um, you'll soon find yourself working alone. 
So starting off correctly, understand your property development rights. Every property has rights in place. It's set in stone. You need to understand that first. Understand if there's value, if there's potential on that site. If you see value, get that tested. Get a professional to help you. Um, and then once you, they, you understand potential, understand the feasibility of the project. What are the options that can go onto that site? And what is the potential outcome? Is it viable? Test that against your realtor. Make sure that you get out the gates correctly based on the correct information. Uh, there's a hell of a lot of work that must be done before you get out the gates. And that's a very important part of, of this entire process. Otherwise, of, let's say, a seven-stage process, if you don't do stage one correctly, you're going to do four stages and waste everybody else's time and get to a point where you can't sell or the project is not viable. Awesome, thank you. Andre? Um, okay, I want to echo what, what Rosig and Skulk said and just add to that, and, and this is something I discuss with Francois quite often, um, and, and I talk from, from a personal perspective, personal journey as well, and as uh, from, from maybe a bit more business philosophical point of view, is play within your means because you, you, you shouldn't just go chase that. If you're starting off with development, don't go chase that Two hundred million dollar project or two hundred million rand project. It, it's it, you could pull it off, yes. But I'm not. I'm not a pessimist here. But I would rather start a bit smaller, get those smaller plots together, make sure it's within your funding parameters. You can have a bit more control with the developer that you partner with, and you build your own track record. Very importantly, make a little bit less profit. Then experience is a wonderful thing, and everybody views. Uh, you favorably of putting all those um, uh, uh, developments together and instead of wasting, like, like Rosic said, also a lot of time on, on the wrong opportunity. So make sure the opportunity is right. It's more or less within your capital framework. Start a bit smaller, but get it going. Over time, it's incredible what your confidence level will be as a developer once you've delivered a few projects. Being it smaller already, it doesn't matter. And then the big ones will just naturally come your way. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, before I get to you, uh, Francois, for your piece of advice, quick one here with uh, Roger just asking on the chat. He says he's got a four bed, uh, sorry, a property that's got four times two bed semis under one roof with GR2 zoning. Um, if you wanted to go up one floor to duplicate the ground floor in Densfa, uh, how small does his professional team have to be or big? And who's the first person he turns to before signing the OTP? Can, can I just jump in here? I'm just like smiling. I just see Go GR2. Uh, general Residential 2 is perfect for your zoning. Uh, it's the perfect zoning for what you want to do. Um, it depends on how big your, your, your develop, how far you want to go, but you essentially need a good architect, a good QS, uh, a structure engineer, and, and you're basically there. You're on your way. Um, and make sure that you've got your student housing um, off taker in place before you start any of those type of, 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 of renovations. But otherwise, GR2 is the perfect zone. Yeah, so awesome. So, so, so I would say, Razik, so turning to an architect that knows this stuff first is probably the first person you go to. Andre, quick one does he have to wait to see Razik before he can sign the OTP, or there's some suspensive conditions he can put into the agreement that will protect him? Yeah, look, I, I will always say, obviously, go see the 31st or put the, the OTP in place because that's for two reasons. You secure your rights and the other reason is you won't waste Rosic's time or anybody else's time um, by, by viewing opportunities and by the time he's made an assessment, then the guy sold it to somebody else. Also, talking from personal experience um, between uh, us as experts here where that has happened many times before, um, so you want to have that relationship strong with your professional team and to keep it strong, you need to deliver projects and not waste time. So um, I, I would say secure your rights. If it's not secured yet, that's the first point. And then you go start and activate because you can always secure your rights in a due diligence or quite a few different suspensive conditions. Awesome. Well, for, cool. uh, in this instance, you got some free information there. It's a great property. So go see your attorney and secure that opportunity. Awesome. Uh, Francois, a tip from you just to finish off. Yeah, sure. Just to, just to add to um, the answers there quickly around the GR2 zoning. Um, it seems like my internet's 
giving me problems. Can you hear me, Grant? Yeah, I can hear you. Sure. So, so before I engage any of my team or waste their time, I do my own desktop analysis. So I can run the numbers. First of all, what, what, what can I afford? What is the strategy here? What do I want to do? Um, is it a viable project? What, do, what can I afford to pay for the land? From there on, I would go sit with Andre and secure the opportunity with due diligence. And only after that, I'll get the team on board. Um, but I mean, that's, we're going to deal with all those processes in the, in the course that we're going to be doing. But so remember, some... uh, Franco, you're, you're an architect by, by training, so you, you, you've got that, that behind yeah. skill. As, uh, as is my wife. That's why we diversify. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I think, you know, you've got to think, you've got to be innovative in this time, in this time period. Think, think out the box, like we've spoken about in the last session. Um, Bob, all the guys have mentioned the importance of the team and we can't labor that point enough. Um, you know, yes, we in property, but really we're all about, there's two things we look at. We look at deal structure and risk. Those, those we really mitigate, we're in a process of mitigating risks in, risk in this business. And it all comes back to deal structure. How you start the process with your attorney and with your team will probably determine the outcome at the end of the day. So it's so, so key. We always look at what is the worst case scenario? What is the risk? Am I happy with that risk? Yes, then, then we'll take the next step and we'll proceed. Because it's not only your own time, you've got a whole team of people that you're working with. I mean, it's all about building knowledge. I mean, the only way you can really, um, you know, Go forward is to build your knowledge and whether you apply it to bigger, smaller developments. I fully agree with Andre. Start small, start within your means and your skill set. Find the right partners, but keep building your knowledge. And um, don't don't give up. Simple as that. Just don't give up. Don't quit. Uh, but also don't quit your day job. Uh, first, first get into developments over, <laughs> over time period. Um, um, Andre and Razik know my story. I mean, we, we learned the hard way. And I think that's why also we're passionate about, you know, sharing the knowledge that we've built the hard way over the years. So I just don't quit. Absolutely. So cool. And, and from my point of view, um, I think there's two things that don't go it alone. Um, I think it's clear from this conversation is, is don't try and do it alone. Um, pick up an expert team. Um, their costs, I'm tell you, um, will far be outweighed by the losses you make if you don't take a professional down the road with you. And the second part is don't let the lack of capital stop you. I think it's clear that you can go down this journey um, by creating uh, creative deal structures and liaising with people to secure a development and then find the financing thereafter. So um, my two things, don't go to loan and um, don't let the lack of capital stop you. So, the, 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 you know, firstly, thanks, guys, for joining us and, and thank you to everybody. We got up to 99 people participating in this call. It's quite cool. Um, the recording will be available for everybody. So if you are interested in, in sharing the recording out, with anyone, let me know, and I can send you a link to the recording um, of this hour and a half um, conversation. But the the, the re reality is, we you know, there's a lot more to development than just a one hour conversation. If you are quite serious about getting into development, we've put together a series, and again, a twelve episode series, where um, the guys that have joined us today will be um, uh, dealing with more in much more detail areas around development, um, answering much more detailed questions and liaising with you to try and help you take a step towards um, investing in property and, and developing uh, and getting becoming a developer. Um, again, uh, it was referred to at the beginning of the conversation that it's quite a closed uh, closed group of people and and uh, people don't or, or developers have tradition not like sharing their ideas, thoughts um, and information, but we're in a much more collab collaborative um, space and time in the moment where you know, guys like uh, Andre Razik, um, Francois and Skalk are willing to share their information and knowledge, realizing that, uh, you know, by creating good developers and good developments, they build their own teams um, and build their own networks. So it's important they do so. So I'm going to be sending out an email after this, um, probably this afternoon to everybody, just with more details around how you can get involved with the series. Um, we'd love to see as many of you on, the, uh, on each of those uh, 12 episodes as possible just to sort of take you forward. It's going to be a learning experience. We're not going to charge the earth for it, um, but the links will be in the emails coming out this afternoon, and we really look forward to having you guys join on those uh, development um, webcasts going forward. Um, again, thanks to the professional team for, for joining us, Skull, Grazik, Andre, and Francois. And, uh, yeah, look forward to speaking to you all again soon. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Cheers, Thank you. Cheers. Bye.